All right, welcome American Outlaws. This is Justin Brunk, and I'm here with Corey Donahue, Cody, and Chris. And you got a couple new, they're old faces, but. Uh, I'm not new. <laughs> I said old faces, new to the podcast, sort of, but no, even, Co- even Chris is. <laughs> I was on the first ever podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you did hey, splendidly on that one, on the by the way. Uh, Thanks for that introduction. Perfect. Well, we could, well, hey, we got we got a new thing for everyone out there that we're trying right now—a new series um, that we're gonna let Chris and Cody take over. Um, we want to try to get uh, more players and um, figures in the soccer world, the U.S. soccer world, on to get a more a longer, a long-term, a long-form interview, whatever you like to call it. And, uh, um, and so we're going to take a, a bit of a back, back seat on this one and maybe others and let them kind of lead it. Uh, the very first one we have uh, right now, uh, we're going to try to do video and audio with uh, the man, one of the best resumes. And I was looking over this uh, of any U.S. soccer player ever is Benny Philhaber, one of the guys that uh, – almost everyone on here uh, fell in love with at the very beginning of what American Outlaws uh, uh, is. So um, I don't know. I'm excited for you guys. Uh, I think this is something that you guys have been wanting to do for a while. Uh, Maybe you two can uh, uh, give us a little uh, intro and what you're trying to do. Yeah. So I guess with especially the, the, the COVID-19 stuff that's going on, it kind of, it kind of sparked this, but, been wanting to do it for a while like Justin said just trying to get more more faces and uh more more names involved in in the AO podcast to try to give you guys a little bit more of an insight as to what is going on with uh with U.S. soccer um for the men and the women um going you know currently and what's going forward and uh no one wants to hear hear us talk too much so we figured we'd get you know use our name to try to get some some new guests on and and give you guys some good content and uh, um, just an added bonus for being a member. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> they tell better stories than us anyways. So <laughs> uh, I'm excited for this uh, guys. Um, super pumped that you guys are doing this and, you know, we're going to have a lot more uh, keep on the lookout for, uh, in AO emails online and uh, you'll be able to see them on YouTube uh, on our podcast series um, on iTunes and, SoundCloud and Chris wants it on Spotify and all those other places. So I'm sure we'll get it there. So it's going to be everywhere. It's going to be all over the interwebs. When you go to internet.com, you're going to find this podcast. (laughs) And can I say too, 100% more Nickelback in this episode than any other podcast that's ever been. Uh Can we get some Creed too? Oh, no, no. Oh, okay. Well, I, draw the line. I make a I make a stained I make a stained reference about every episode, so we've got them covered. <laughs> They're gonna think we have the worst music <laughs> ever. I'm glad there's gonna be less of Corey in the next one. <laughs> I think anyway. we're all glad about that. <laughs> Anyways, Corey included. The first episode up um, is gonna be with Benny Philhaber. I'm excited for it. It's gonna be awesome. He's been around. He's been had some of the most iconic moments that. Uh, us as fans have ever seen so super excited and uh, after this quick break uh, we'll get right into it so today we have a very special guest uh, to the American Outlaws pod class Uh, this player had a very successful club career in Hamburg then he went to Derby, Airhus, New England, KC, LAFC, Colorado and then back to KC prior to hanging up the boots this year he has represented both the U20 and the U23 national teams to then represent the full national team in numerous friendlies, World Cup qualifying, the Gold Cup, Copa America, Confederation Cup, and last but not least, the 2010 FIFA World Cup. After retiring from playing in March of this year, he is now host to the best American soccer podcast available known as the BSI podcast, BSI The Podcast. Benny Failhaber, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, I, uh, I'm pretty proud of that last bit right there. I mean, you said World Cup, which is co- kind of cool, but then BSI, the podcast, that's where it's at now. I mean, I, I don't want to say this, but I feel like your game has been elevated so much in the past few weeks since retirement. 
I, I'm, I'm so proud. So, <laughs> so yeah, well, we, we started off as amateurs on the podcast and now we feel like we're the pros sharing uh, information with everybody during this quarantine time. You guys are, you guys are paving the way for, for us and others. So we're just following you. Um, <laughs> So Benny, tell us a little bit about, you know, we talked about it earlier, but are you, are you quarantined? How's, uh, how's life been for you for the past few weeks? Yeah. So I'm a homebody. So in that regard, it hasn't been the hardest thing, but yes, I've been quarantining, uh, myself, my family, um, we're, we're in Kansas, so it's definitely not, you know, the worst place to be in the U S right now. Um, you know, we got t tons of space, we got backyards, we got a big house. And so we got a little bit of space for ourselves. And, uh, but the toughest part is being, uh, a parent with three kids under six years old right now. So that wow. is the most difficult task I've ever, I've ever had, you know, put upon me. So obviously my wife's been, uh, the backbone of the family while, while I played soccer and, and taking care of, of a lot of the kids in the house and that kind of thing. And now, you know, I'm, I'm helping out, but now there's no school. So they're not going to school. There's not that like, you know, buffer for the, the two older ones to kind of go to school. And, and then when they get back, we're in a better, you know, sense to really parent. Now it's just like, man, it's 24 seven, it's grueling, it's tiring. And uh, it, it's tough to be a good parent during these times. Sounds pretty quiet back there though. I don't they hear just they and... just went for their naps. That's oh. why, uh, that's why I had to book it at two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. All right. Well, I, I want to start with, tell me a little bit about the podcast. Hey, Christopher. Can How I, did I, it come I'm to be? No, 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 no. Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Benny. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> Benny, back to, back to my question. Tell me a little bit about the podcast. <laughs> How did it start? What are you, what are your guys' goals for it? And I, I also want to hear a little bit about the GoFundMe. So, yeah. So, you know, first and foremost, I'll talk about the GoFundMe. I'll start there just because that's something that we felt like we could, you know, do to, to help people's lives right now. I know a lot of people are, you know, losing money. Uh, people are losing their lives. People are, you know, losing time with their loved ones. And so there's a lot of stuff that's, um, you know, negative right now. And, and, and the one thing that we could kind of contribute with um, with our podcast is, you know, starting a GoFundMe page and, uh, we've, we've tried to get to 10,000. Honestly, I was hoping we'd get there quicker. I was a little bit, um, disappointed with it, but I, I'm, I'm so grateful for the people that have been able to provide some, some funds for the, for the fund. And so, uh, you know, hopefully we can hit that 10,000 and, uh, it's on, it's on GoFundMe and it's, I mean, you could put the link, but I think the link's actually pretty easy. It's GoFundMe forward slash F forward slash BSI, the podcast. So it's pretty easy. And, uh, you know, people can go on there and, and give what they can, obviously don't give what you can't, but it's a time that we can help people. So we wanted to start with that. Um, but in terms of the podcast, yeah, we started, me and Sal had the idea from when we hit, when we had the Benny Failhaber show, uh, on when we both played at Sporting Kansas City, I think it was in 2014. And we had a little bit of success with that. We, we put some YouTube videos up through, you know, Sporting KC and a lot of our fans, you know, enjoyed it. And so we thought, hey, maybe we got, you know, a little bit of chemistry. We can kind of start something in the future. And we thought, you know, what's, what's a better time when I got traded back here to kind of, you know, tr give it a go. We knew we'd have a little bit of a following here in Kansas City. And so that would help. And so we started off slow. If you go back and probably listen to the first couple episodes, it's um, choppy at best. And so, uh, you know, we started getting into it. We got Ike into the show, which was a massive uptick in terms of, you know, the, the banter that he brought. The, obviously, Ike's interrogation has become, you know, probably the biggest hit on the show. And so, uh, yeah, it's been fun. And we just kind of gone with it. Um, at first, it was mo mostly guys that we had on our phones, you know, good friends that we played with. Um, and so it's kind of developed into something more now. We've been able to get some coaches. Uh, we're looking to get a technical director in here pretty soon. We had obviously Will <laughs> Farrell. And so it's just been, yeah, it's been kind of like a little roller coaster ride and we're just enjoying it. Um, and, and yeah, that's where we're at right now. If you guys haven't listened to it, I would stop listening to this podcast, jump over to theirs because it, <laughs> it really is good. I'm, from my perspective or from a fan's perspective, what, what I think that I enjoy about it is for guys like us that have played our whole lives, you know, that obviously aren't pro, but I'm really curious about the, 
the locker room stuff and the and the travel and the and the club stuff and the national team and the and the stories that go around that. And I I think you guys do an incredible job of sharing that story that I I can't wait every week to listen to it. And you know, last week you guys had Will Ferrell, which was hilarious, but um, the range of guests you guys have had have, have been amazing. So um, I'm really impressed Rob, with it. How's Rob Stone just so good on whatever like TV and mic that oh, he uh, he is? He he's has. he's a pro. I mean, that's what he's good at, right? He's he's articulate. He's good at telling stories. I knew he was going to be a good guest, no matter what you know he said. It was going to be interesting, and so uh, yeah, Rob was Rob was great. Mo was very good as well. I thought Mo Hilarious. came. I think maybe a couple of weeks before him. And I know Mo's, you know, doing TV, but he's new to it. And I thought he was, he's a storyteller. Th th those are the best, the, the oh. storytellers. Even Alan Gordon, he's a storyteller. You know, you could tell he just wants to tell you a story and, and you just sit there and enjoy it. And so, yeah, that's like the, the best thing about our show that I will say I, I find it very unique is that we can get mostly, not everybody, but mostly we get people feeling comfortable enough where you're just chatting to each other on a Skype call or Zoom call or whatever. And, uh, it's like, you're, you're on the, you're, you're on the bus, you're on the plane, you're in the locker room and you're just, you know, talking about the stories that you've kind of come across throughout your career. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys have for the future, because like I said, for guys like us that are quarantined, it's, it's the best thing that we have right now. What do you want, yeah. Justin? God, I was, I was going to, uh, brag, uh, about Benny. I was writing down some stats of like, what you played in uh, before the podcast, U-20 World Cup, Confederations Cup, World Cup, Olympics, scored against Mexico. Can I give my interview? I have questions for him about this shit. No. I barely played in the Olympics, though. I know, but how many players have done all that? And now we can move uh, I don't know. But that is – I just thought about I, that. Like, I haven't gotten to the point in my retirement to actually – like, I know the things that I've accomplished, and sometimes I'm, I'm baffled by – the things that I was able to do or did, I guess, just, you know, playing in a world cup, you know, I would have never thought that was possible, you know, 20 years ago. And even now looking back, it's kind of crazy to think about it that not only did I play in a world cup, but I actually, you know, played, I came into several games and had an influence and yeah, it's special, but I haven't gotten to the point where I've really, you know, how, how many players have been able to have this kind of career and um, this longevity and, and, and that kind of thing. So maybe, I don't know when I'm 40 or something. <laughs> so before we start talking about your playing days um i want to start a new segment on the podcast it's called look at this photograph okay hold up cody and what i want you to do is you'll, you'll look at a, pot, a photo that we've pulled and give us a give us a sentence or a story about what the picture means to you <laughs> <laughs> and I got I got Chad's approval to play that, so we shouldn't have any royalties or anything like that. I hope they come at us. I'm pretty sure this is uh, 17. So Open Cup Championship 17. A few words that I can remember, um, you know, to describe that game. One, I'll always remember that I had a big like uh, soft cast on my hand because I had broken my finger, I think, at one point a couple couple weeks before. And I'll always remember the pass that I had to Daniel on that on that play where he. Um, he kind of makes a really good run and he just has to toe poke it past the goalie. I guess the yeah. last thing that I remember, the last thing I really remember about that game is playing against a really good buddy on the opposite side, Sasha. And uh, we've always been really good friends, but really competitive. And you always have that extra motivation to try and beat one of your good friends in a, in a final. Do you guys remember that game? That was against Red Bull at, at Sporting Park. It was an electric atmosphere. That was one of the, the better domestic atmospheres I've ever been in. So that was good shit. Oh boy, that game was terrible. <laughs> I came in to that game. We were losing 3-0 at Arsenal at Emirates and we ended up losing 5 and I remember, I mean the team our team was was terrible. You know, Derby County was terrible. We were we were there's a reason why we're the the worst team in Premier League history. So, um but having said that, it was one of my first few games I think like yeah, a couple games in to 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 you know my tenure I guess at Derby if you can call it a tenure but uh I came in and I remember Fabregas scored a goal kind of on me where he kind of dribbled me he ripped a shot it was a good finish but like it was still kind of on me and I I didn't take care of what I should have and I remember I got yelled at and I'm thinking in my head okay fair enough I did something bad but 
God, you put me into a game where we were getting absolutely demolished anyways. It's kind of hard to single me out in that circumstance. But, yeah, that game was – that was ugly. 5-0 game at Emirates. All right. And last but certainly not least, uh, what I think is a very raw photo. Look at this photograph. <laughs> <laughs> this is at Azteca. And I'll still, ne- I'll, I can never understand how that referee didn't give him, he didn't give him a yellow card. I mean, to me, it's a red card. You put your hands up on someone's neck, but um, I, I, pro- I probably like indulged it a little bit. You know, I, I kind of play acted it a little bit, but you could see he, that's, uh, God, what's his name? Torado. Yeah. Torado had his hands all over me and we, uh, we ended up losing that game. Unfortunately, Charlie scored one of the best goals I've seen. Um, for the national team, especially at Azteca. And, and uh, you know, they came back with a couple – their tying goal was probably bad defending by us, and then they get a second. We almost tie the game at the end, but unfortunately we lost 2-1. But, yeah, that scene, I, the ref's right behind me, and he can't, can't pull the card out. Maybe it's just me, but I don't – somebody's hands are on my neck. I don't know if you can be overly dramatic about that. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah, fair enough. That, that's the last one I've got. So thank you for playing our inaugural game. Yeah, I'm I'm bad I'm bad at like the one word things because I I I can remember every game I pretty much ever played in, and so it tends to become a paragraph. Sorry about that. No, that's good. <laughs> Justin, what do you want? Oh, I was I mean I'm just every time I see Azteca, it's like I remember my experience there as a fan and just like your experience as a player in that stadium. Man, I can't imagine. Yeah, it it's fantastic. I mean, I think I've only played there. With the national team, I'm pretty sure I only played there once in that game. Um, I can't remember if I ever played – I don't think I ever played a club game there because we played uh, Cruz Azul, but that's not at Azteca. I don't think I ever played there again. But the stadium is fantastic. And so I, I was on the bench that game. I came in in the second half and just watching it, you know, getting to take it all in as opposed to, like, maybe you're too focused to actually appreciate it. It was, it was something special. Corey's got a question. Let me uh, unmute him. Go ahead. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Is it as hard to breathe at Azteca as everybody says it is? Uh, yeah. So I've never thought it was that hard at Rio Tinto or at um, my, at um, God, I can't remember what's what's the stadium name. At it's Colorado. Sporting, it's Park. Yeah. Is it Dick? Yeah. Oh yeah, Dick Sporting Park. I, I wasn't there long enough. People are gonna give me crap for that. But anyways, <laughs> um, yeah, those two like don't bother me that much. But yeah, Azteca is a big difference. You you can you can definitely feel it. You can actually see it because I, I remember in warm ups you're trying to you know if you like try and hit long balls and you try and curl them, they don't curl because the ball doesn't actually catch the air. So it just kind of goes straight. You curl it, but it, like you can even see it maybe in Charlie's shot. It doesn't curl that much. It kind of goes straight, which actually might have helped them in that sense. But um, <laughs> yeah, the balls they don't really curl in, in the in the air because it's so it's so um, you know. Do they like tell in, you that? I guess before you get there, or is it like something you figure out while you play? Like, is that part in of the ter- in terms play? of the physical differences or the like the breathing? Oh, uh, the physical. Uh, no, I, I, nobody told me that. I just started <laughs> noticing it. I was like, I remember, I think day before taking free kicks or shooting on target. And the ball really didn't curl. So if you like put it outside the post to kind of curl it back in, it wouldn't do it. So you kind of, kind of, you got to just kind of shoot where you're aiming and, and forget about curling it around anything. Fascinating. Yeah. All right. So before we get into some of the bigger moments with your national team career, I want to, I want to start from the beginning. Um, you know, you obviously walked on at UCLA um, around 2005. Let's just start there. You played in the U-20 World Cup, I believe, and that's when Hamburg spotted you. Um, tell me about that experience a little bit. So when I first started with the under-20s, I was a kind of a no-namer. You know, I had walked on to UCLA. Ziggy became the coach. He took over the, the, the team from Rongen because Rongen became the Chivas USA coach. And, and uh, he gave me a chance. But there were five UCLA guys that he brought in, and him being a UCLA guy, he felt pressure, you know, to – those guys weren't all going to make the team or else he was going to get crap for it. And so I remember thinking I got to outplay, you know, whoever I'm trying to beat by a wide margin in order to get called up to this team. And I did well in camps and I kind of like improved each and every time. And I eventually made it to like the qualifying team and played with the qualify with the twenties and the qualifiers played well and just kind of led to the twenties. And in, in at the world cup, 
for whatever reason, I mean, I was in, I was in really good form. Um, I, I felt good about, you know, I, I was confident. I, I felt good about playing against, you know, whoever we were playing against. I mean, the first game we played against Argentina and, you know, the second half Messi comes in and I'm trying as best I can to kind of man mark him at the time. Um, and so, you know, winning that game gives you confidence. You play against Germany. We outplayed him, but we couldn't win. And then we get through uh, with Egypt before losing to Italy in the, I think, quarters or round of 16. Um, but that, that entire experience was really what propelled me to become a professional soccer player. And, and I didn't even know it at the time that there were so many scouts there. I don't think I even thought about it like, you know, let me really play well here to become a pro in Europe. It wasn't, that wasn't the thought. It was just, you know, let, let me do well and maybe I can be part of the next national team or whatever, you know, kind of stay where I am. And so, yeah, it, it, it just worked out that there were a lot of teams there. I was, I was probably one of the better players on our team during that tournament and got sought out by Hamburg, uh, Kaiser Slauten, Heronvain, and Mallorca. And the two teams that really showed interest were Hamburg and Heronvain in terms of, you know, financially. And they, I mean, they asked me to come out to the, the teams and I could feel it that they really wanted me. And it became between those two teams and I, I chose Hamburg um, and the rest is history. But yeah, it was, um, it was a special moment and kind of a whirlwind moment. So 2006, I think you're playing for the Hamburg Reserves at the time. Um, you play a full season with them. You start training with the first team around that time. The, U, the, the 06 World Cup happens in Germany. Were, I'm just curious, were you, were you in Germany at the time or were you back in, in the States during the World Cup? Um, I think. I think I was back in the state. So now I'm trying to remember. I, I, I haven't thought about that. I, I think what happened was, so the first year I was in Hamburg, I trained with the first team every, pretty much every day. But we, there was still a rule where you can only have four foreigners on the first team, and there were already four foreigners, so I couldn't be part of the first team yet. Hmm. And at the end of the year, of course, I went back to the U.S. Yeah. But I think I'm not positive, but I think we were back in Germany for preseason before the World Cup had officially ended. So I think I was there for maybe, you know, Germany playing the third place game and maybe losing the semis and the finals as well. So I, for the majority of the games, I think I was probably in the U.S., but I think I made it back to Germany for the last few games. Obviously not watching them live, but I watched them on TV. So the U.S., obviously, we, we were all there. It has a terrible World Cup. Um, we come home. You're playing well at the time. I'm just curious, Claudio Reyna didn't have a great tournament that tournament. He's 33 years old. Was it in your head at the time, this could be my shot to, uh, to get called up and play some games? No, not really. Not at all. <laughs> the only, no, because the only thing I was thinking at the time is I wanted to break into the, the Hamburg's team, you know. And so in, um, in 2005, 2006, I, I didn't play with the first team, um, and, and that was my – only thought process was trying in 2006 2007 to be able to have a good preseason with the first team show that I'm ready to play hopefully play some games and, and find my footing there it wasn't um until you know much later that I guess not much later you know Bob called me in what was it for I think it was the Ecuador game maybe March or February of 2007 something like that yep. and uh and so towards the end of that season that I actually started breaking into the team is, is when I got called up. But I know until then, until Bob actually called me, I hadn't even thought about the national team. I didn't realize that I was maybe close to, you know, that picture yet. Hmm. So I guess that's, that's my first memory of Benny Falhaber, the player. Um, I remember watching the game with these dudes in Nebraska and you played in that, in, in that Jersey that Corey's wearing, I think um, yep. against Ecuador and I think we won that game three three one maybe LD three one Landon Patrick, Patrick. yeah yep. um, so <laughs> I remember that game I, so well it was a good game um, from from our perspective we saw a youthful kid that that's got some creativity and I, I think it was something that we definitely lacked during the World Cup um, I guess what was your perspective after your first match knowing that you you could hang with these guys. That, that was it, you know, that I could hang with these guys. And that's always like the first thing that you want to feel um, when you kind of get to that next level. So whether it be, you know, me with the 20s or me in Hamburg um, or, of course, me with the national team, 
you know, that's the first thing you want to feel that, that you, okay, I can play in this level. It's not like these guys are, you know, miles ahead of me. And so in that game, you know, the fact that we, we played well as a team in that game, Landon played really well and we kind of were always winning. Um, it, it, it gives you that, that confidence and it was a good game to, you know, to get your debut. And so, um, I remember I started, I think I started with Pablo. I can't remember who started next to me, but it wasn't Michael. Michael came in in the second half. And I remember in the second half we started real, and we were both really young guys. I mean, he was what, two years younger than me. So I think I was 22 and he was 20 maybe, but we both really started feeling good about how we were playing next to one another. And, um, and yeah, it, it felt like at the end of that game, it's like, if, if I can keep this going, you know, me and Michael could be a guy that guys that, you know, the national team really rely on. Obviously Michael's had a fantastic career. Um, probably one of the top five, you know, ever in, in the national team uh, history, I guess, and especially in that position. But, um, you know, we, we both got, you know, pretty good careers since then. It, it would have been nice to have played, you know, maybe more games even, but we could sense that there was something there even in that very first game. So right after that, you get a few months later, you get called in the Gold Cup, um, the 07 Gold Cup. And we all remember that Gold Cup for a variety of reasons. But um, I want to fast forward to the final. I, we can talk about the volley all day, but I want to hear a little bit about the game in Chicago, the, the U.S.-Mexico. That was your first experience with, with this level of game, I think. Um, tell us about the atmosphere in the stadium, how you were feeling for the game, so on. Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the story that I always remember from that game is not before the game or, you know, during the game, it's actually at halftime because we played, we didn't play well in the first half. Um, Mexico was all, all over us. Obviously everybody knows it was like whatever minimum, what 90, 10 Mexican yeah. fans in that, in that stadium, it was hot. And, and you just felt like, you know, nothing had gone right in the first half. And I know that, and Mike, I was only playing because Michael got a red card in the, in the semis. And so I had to step in, um, for Michael and I was playing with Pablo and I, and I, and I hadn't played well. And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, he's going to make a sub at halftime and it's going to be me and I'm going to be devastated because like, I really want to turn it around from, from, you know, what the first half had been. And, I know that Rico's about to go in and at the end of his like spiel at halftime, he says, Rico is going to come in for Pablo. And I was, I couldn't believe it. I thought for sure I was coming out. And, and so when he said that it was Pablo and I was staying in almost in my head, I thought, you know, Bob's giving me opportunity here because I, to be honest, I don't even know if I've deserved to, to keep playing because I wasn't one of the best players and I'm one of the youngest guys. And he put that confidence in me. And so I remember wanting to play well, and in that second half to even take away the the volley that obviously you're gonna not hit very often but you know it was at the right moment but take away the volley I still think I played really well in that second half um me and Rico you know played well together I was able to kind of get forward more Rico was able to cover more ground he allowed myself Clint um Landon guys to kind of push forward and we were able to kind of start bossing the game a little bit more and and, and kind of taking over and so um, you know, I'll never forget that moment at halftime where I thought, you know, my day was done. And then, you know, what it would have been crazy to, you know, my, my whole career might have been in a different path if it, if it hadn't been for that second half. Crazy. So Brian Ching gets pulled down around the 62nd minute. LD scores a PK. And I think it was around the 78th minute. Um, it was 73rd. 73rd. Right. So I, I'm curious about the, the, the lead up to that moment when, you know, corner comes in, gets headed clear. It's kind of looping way above your head. Um, I've heard LD talk about how he, at first he wishes you were going to take it down and put a cross in. Tell me I about. I think he wanted me, I think he wanted me to pull it, pull it down and, and hit it back uh, to him so he could in. cross it. In. So, I think so. Yeah. Cause he was out wide taking corner. What's going through your head, that ball, you know, we, none of us could hit anything like that, obviously, but I'm, we played the game long enough. That's one of those one in a million scenarios where the ball comes down to you like that and you hit it that well. Um, have you been practicing that up until that point or did you just say, screw it, I'm going to hit it? No. Yeah. I, I, you don't, I mean, I don't practice stuff like that. You know, I, I think I have a decent shot from outside the box, but you don't practice, you know, volleys coming out, you know, 10, 15 feet over your head. The only thing that I, so I remember, that 
Spectre had just been knocked out of the game. So it was kind of like a, kind of a little bit of a hectic situation where I think Frankie Simic was coming into the game and Spectre was kind of concussed trying to get off the field. And, um, and so it was kind of all of a it was it was one of those where you're not planning. You're like, you're not really completely focused and ready for the moment. And it almost just kind of came to me. And I think because, you know, I didn't have to overthink it, um, you know, what happened happened. And it's the, the one thing that I do remember in terms of like technical aspect of it, I remember the ball being up in the air for so long and you can't see this in the video because you're kind of following the ball, but I actually align myself. I have time to actually get under the ball as opposed to like maybe let it loop maybe to the side of my body and make it more of a side volley. That would have been a harder hit. And I can get my body right under the ball where it's coming straight to me. And so I'm just like, all right, once this ball gets to my foot level, I'm just putting my, my leg through it. And and, and that was the one thing that I remember from, you know, putting myself in the right spot. I had enough time when the ball went up in the air. And the one thing, uh, Sasha, Sasha actually flew in for Copa America that day. So he didn't get to see the game. He was on a plane. And so when he, and I told him, I'm like, dude, did you see what happened after the game? He's like, no, I heard that you scored, but I didn't see anything. I'm like, I can't believe I scored this goal. And he tells, and then when we're together in the, in the room and he's seen the highlights, He's like, dude, that was a cheerleader kick. The cheerleader <laughs> kicked it. So, like, you know, like when they just – and that's yeah. exactly the thought process that I had because I wanted to just get right underneath the ball so that if I'm, if I'm hitting it, I'm hitting right through the center of the ball. Obviously, you know, a million things can go wrong. You can, you can miss it or it can, like, hit someone and then it doesn't go in the goal and gets deflected or whatever. But for whatever reason, that ball found, you know, the corner of the, of the goal on that day. Crazy moment. Um, one of the – Corey, shut up. One of the uh, <laughs> best volleys I I think any of us will ever see, and as nerd soccer fans, we want to say we appreciate it because that that was that was awesome. What do you want, Corey? Oh, you're gonna let me talk? Thanks. Yeah. I uh, one one more thing to add to the legend of that game, which I bet Benny doesn't know, is that uh, I don't think it would have been called American Outlaws without that game because a bunch of us traveled up to Chicago for the game. And one of our buddies wore the bandana over his face, uh, and we all liked it. So we all started doing it after that. And that's, that's largely what led to us calling it American Outlaws. It was, just, one, uh, it was one of the most like, yeah. moments of like American Outlaws and just us oh, yeah. individually as fans. And I don't know how much we can stress that. It's like that goal. Like, and like and, how that, and, and the, experience, the experience from it being 90, 10 Mexican fans – to after the game, we're doing the victory lap around the stadium, and now it's mostly all American fans. Like, there, there's no describing like how awesome that feeling is. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So, U.S. goes on to win to win the Gold Cup, obviously. Um, and what a, what a, what a moment! But um, I want to talk a little bit. I want to fast forward because then that summer, I think you guys head down to Copa America. You, uh, you guys play some good games down there tell me about that experience yeah I, th that's almost like a, a bittersweet tournament for me because I was you know because of that goal and 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 all the you know that it brought our team we won gold cup we qualified for confederations cup I think that was maybe the time at least as at least as a young player that I, that I had the most confidence in myself you know and and obviously that happens when you do something good or you, you're playing well or you're in a good runner form and I remember down in, in uh, Venezuela, I mean, I was, I, I could not be more confident. And obviously, it, maybe it even helped that some of the superstars of the national team weren't there, you know, so Landon wasn't there, Clint wasn't there. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm forgetting people, but there were, you know, the, the, the big time leaders weren't there. It was, it was a B team. And so I, I think I could, I felt like I could be myself a little bit more and maybe take more of the reins. And I felt really good in that tournament. I mean, it was disappointing that we, you know, we had some good performances. Um, you know, obviously Argentina was, was one of the best teams at the time. And uh, we take the lead off of what I say is my best pass of all time to Eddie Johnson. I think that's my best pass of all time. I don't know if you guys remember that, but. Um, you got taken down, I, right? Yeah, I, I kind of like, uh, I don't know if it was like a loose ball, but I kind of intercept the ball in midfield, take a touch, and then hit the ball with the outside of my right foot over like yeah. 60 yards in between their two center backs. And Eddie like runs through it, 
uh, takes a touch into the box and, and gets tripped up and gets a, a penalty. Yep. Um, but that game, and then the we played Paraguay, um, and and I, we outplayed them. But we, you know, Johnny makes a mistake and they score, um, you know, kind of a, an easy an easy goal. We we played well. I mean, Rico scored a great goal, if I'm not mistaken, in that game. And I think we could have done better in that tournament. So for for me, that experience was one where I felt really good about where my game was, and I wish I. I could have helped the team more, but our team played well, but just couldn't get the results that we needed um, against some, obviously some good competition in South America. Definitely. So fast forwarding to the following summer, you head down to the Olympics. Um, you talk about, uh, you've talked a lot about it on your podcast. Um, a really stacked team, you know, obviously everyone remembers the names um, and the team, you know, you're, you're Michael Bradley, Freddie Adu, Sasha, Stu, all them boys. Um, you guys have a, a good tournament, but don't end up. F I think you finished third, maybe four points. Uh, yeah, I think we finished third behind uh, uh, Nigeria and Holland, I believe. Yeah, I, I remember that Holland game crazy. So, I, I guess from your perspective, this is the first you're playing with the national team. You've already scored a Golazo to win us the gold cup, and then you go down to the Olympics, and for whatever reason, Peter Novak doesn't play you as much. Um, how does that? affect your your mental you know your mental state as a player um after achieving so much at a young age uh it didn't affect me too much in the sense that you know I mean I knew what kind of player I was and I knew what things I could do and things that you know I wasn't so good at I mean that that didn't I don't think it took away from my confidence in myself um but it's it's disappointing, you know, because it's just like, you know, missing out on a world cup or whatever. And of course I was there during the Olympics, but looking back on it, we, and, and I, and we knew this, I think at the time that we had a good team, but looking back on it, we had a really good team. We could have, we could have really done something in that, in that Olympics. And, um, you know, to be a player that I considered a, a player good enough to, to start on that team and at the very least provide um, you know, something special off the bench. I, I just didn't think I was, you know, utilized enough. I don't think that certain players were utilized enough and it wasn't just me. I mean, I, I, even worse than, you know, me, I think is Josie and Charlie Davis were on that team. Hmm. Neither of them started. They were the starters at Confederations Cup a year later. That's right. <laughs> so That's like, right. it's, it's, it's crazy to think that a year before the two starters for Confederations Cup uh, against you know Spain the best team in the world Brazil one of the best teams in the world couldn't you know start uh, the two starters were Freddie and Brian McBride and so um, you know all credit to Brian McBride he was at, at the end of his career he wasn't you know the, the player that Charlie and Josie were at the time and Freddie um, you know a guy that's always been very good in, in in the youth tournaments and a guy that I think Peter Novak liked a lot wasn't at the level at Charlie or Josie as well at that time. So um, there were other guys that I mean should have been playing and I think would have helped us that weren't. Um, but I mean, you can't, it's hard to like dwell on it too much. And, and that was one of the things that um, probably helped me get over the, the fact that we didn't do as well in the Olympics because I, I just didn't play a big enough part in it. And um, you know, guys, Sasha was playing out of his mind. I remember during the Olympics, he was one of the best players that we had during the time. We had, you know, like you said, Stewart, uh, who was playing, you know, really, really well. We had Michael Parkhurst and Marisa Du in the back, which were fantastic. Brad Guzan was at the top of his game. Um, we had Orozco, I think Marvell, who isn't the best uh, technical player, but I mean, he can, he can, he makes it tough on the opponent, whoever he's, he's playing speedy. against. Yeah. And I mean, so we had players and we had guys on the bench. We had me on the bench. We had Dax on the bench. Um, Zatella. I mean, we had, we had a really good team, obviously Josie and Charlie on the bench. So we had a really good team. I think we could have done more. And I, I just don't agree with some of the decisions that Peter made in that, in, in that, in that tournament. Yep. Crazy stuff. So fast forwarding again, um, after the Olympics, uh, you, I think you, that's about the time you left Darby for Aarhus, right? Yeah. Aarhus. Yeah. Aarhus. Sorry. Yeah. Um, no problem. So I think you spent about, you spent three years there in our who's I spent three years. Yeah. Yeah. Three years. So about that same time you're, you get called in the Confederation cup, you know, another insane tournament tournament from a, from a fan's perspective. Um, 
you know, going into the Egypt game, I'm, I'm curious, you guys, you have to win at least by three goals. What was the mentality going into the game and what was it like in the locker room afterwards? So if I remember correctly, you, I think we had to win by three goals. It didn't matter. Like winning by four wouldn't matter. I think you actually had three was like the most goal differential you could have. I think it had like a, a if I remember correctly, I could be wrong, but I think we needed to win three zero or more, but not give up a goal. And right. Brazil needed to beat Italy three zero or more, but not give up a goal. Cause if, you, if they gave up, a, if it was four one, that wouldn't have mattered or whatever. Correct. Anyways. So I mean, we knew it was virtually impossible, right? So, um, but you're at a tournament that has got, you know, some of the best teams in the world. Uh, I, I think, again, I think we got a little bit unlucky to lose 3-1 to, to Italy. Um, we, we played against Brazil. We played terrible. I think Sash got a red card. Um, so we didn't deserve to win that game. We got crushed. And then we go into Egypt and it's, it's almost like we'd have nothing to lose. I think Charlie started that game and he hadn't started the other ones. Um, and I think that was, you know, really Charlie's coming out party at that time. And he played really well. He, he brought something extra and, and just, it, you kind of started, I think before the game, you just, you want to play for pride. You want to do well. You want to win the game. You don't want to lose, you know, be last place in your group. But as things start to happen and you take a one, nothing lead, and then you take a two nothing lead, and I think at halftime it was two nothing, right? Because Michael scored the second one. Yeah, yep. I think Michael scored the second one, and then you check what the other score is, and it was three zero Brazil at halftime, I believe. So you're like, this is not possible. Is this really happening? And uh, and so you're you, the only thing you're thinking at that time is like, let's just win three zero, and who knows what the hell's going to happen in the other game? But if it stays, you know, three zero, then wow, we're we're going to you know somehow sneak in. And, uh, and I remember I came into that game. Uh, now I can't remember. I think – now I can't remember if I was actually in when Clint scored the third. I can't remember now. I might have just have been coming in or maybe I hadn't come in yet. But anyways, Clint scores the, the third one. And, you know, I, we're looking at the bench. I know I come in at some point and we're looking at the bench to find out what the other scores are. Like, is it still 3-0? Is it still 3-0? And it's – I mean, it's crazy. It was – it was uh, as much as I don't want to bring up, you know, the – the worst game I took part of in the national team, it was the exact opposite of that where everything had to go right for us to go through and it did. And so we're looking back, is it three zeros? And when it, when it ends, we're like, oh, we're, we're through, you know, we're through to the semis and um, it was unbelievable. Probably, you know, three points shouldn't get you to the semis in a tournament like that, but it did. And uh, you know, we, we ran with it and we took the confidence that we had from that Egypt game to Spain. So you go, you go through to the, to the uh, semis, you end up coming against a Spain team that I believe they were unbeaten in 35 games, something like that. Um, you know, obviously stacked, but you guys just pull off a miracle. Are you thinking going to that game? We, we literally have nothing to lose. We, we are playing well. You talk about on the podcast, you guys are playing a, a counterattack style. Did you guys legitimately have confidence you could go in and beat this team? Yeah, we did. Um, uh, that is like as honest of an answer as you can give. Like after that Egypt game, we all thought we can do this. You know, I mean, yes, Spain is probably at that time the best international, you know, team that's ever played. I mean, they, I don't even know if there's ever been anything close to unbeaten in 35 at the international level. And so they had literally everybody besides Messi, I guess, you know, like it was Barcelona without Messi. And so we'll mix in with Real Madrid. And so, you know, the best players in the world. And, uh, but we genuinely had uh, an, a really good idea of how we wanted to play. Bob would set us up, you know, no matter who we were playing, we were going to be a tough team to beat. And um, we felt confident that especially with like Charlie emerging, you know, Josie, Clint, Landon, those guys, all guys that can change the game in a second. Um, we felt good. Like, let's defend. Let's be tough to beat. Let's look to not not allow you know their playmaker Xavi and Yesta to make the game for them be tough on them and then we can take our chances going forward and I mean that was exactly the mindset that's exactly how it panned out obviously Spain had the ball probably the majority of the time but they weren't that dangerous I, I mean they probably had you know a couple chances I remember Fernando Torres had one chance in the first half if I remember correctly but we had bodies I mean it, we made it tough for them you know and and they got um uh, 
they were bothered by it. And, and we were able to play at times. I mean, the first goal we played, you know, it wasn't a counter attack goal. You know, the first goal was foot to foot to foot to foot. Josie bodies, the guy's able to turn, you know, and, and Casillas probably moves a little too early, but I mean, it's a goal. And so that wasn't a counter attacking goal. And the second goal, obviously a little bit of a counter attacking goal. Michael's able to, to poke it. I get the ball and, you know, I've been on teams that, that what happened to Spain has happened to me. And you, you, you have that thought process. I'm, we're the better team. We should be attacking. And you kind of forget about defending a little bit. You know, you're, you're attacking so much or you have the ball and you're trying to get, you know, back into the game that you kind of forget about defending a little bit. And I mean, yes, uh, looking back on it, it was a great little run by me, but they sold themselves so easily, you know, like I, I, I make one fake shot and PK and Puyo kind of both go for it. And I'm able to kind of spring land and, you know, Sergio Ramos on the back post goes to sleep and Clint, like typical Clint, you know, gets in there and, and just pokes at home. And so, um, you know, that game was, it, it never felt even after the one zero or the two zero that we were going to relinquish that we, I think we all felt very comfortable. And honestly, I, I could say that we felt the exact same way going into the Brazil game. So, um, you know, sometimes it doesn't pan out, but it, it was, uh, that's, those are the best three games that I've ever been a part of with the national team. That, yeah, that you guys having confidence on the field. I feel like that Confederations Cup as fan group, like we, I don't think we've ever had as much confidence in the team that we're watching and being fans of on the field than that peak going into the 2010 World Cup. And I think it was because of you guys and like the cut, like the chemistry on the field or just your attitudes or whatever. But that Confederations Cup, I think, just skyrocketed the confidence of fans and just like made it so much fun and just blew up on just like what fan fandom was and what American Allies was for like the next like four years. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, the confidence was through the roof during that time. And I can tell you, honestly, before the Brazil game, we all felt good about it. And, and to be honest, we got unlucky. We got unlucky in that game to not have won. We, we deserve to have won that game. In my opinion, we, we played a great first half. Obviously the goals were fantastic. I mean, peak counterattacking goals, uh, the second one specifically. And then, you know, we go, we give up a goal in the early second half where really lucky goal going through Jay's legs right in the corner. Um, and then we still played well from the 2-1. Uh, we could have got a third. We didn't. And then, you know, towards the last 15 minutes, they take it to us and obviously tie it and, and take the lead. But, um, you know, that game could have, if maybe we get one lucky break in that game, we win that game. Yep. So you guys nearly win the Confederation Cup, which would have been – it was insane anyway, but it, it would have been remarkable had, had uh, you guys held that 2-0 score. But um, So going in, into 2010, you guys – obviously you talked about you're, you're at an all, all-time high in confidence. Um, what, was, what was the thought going into the World Cup? You know, everyone seems to be playing well. Bob Radley seems to have the guys – you know, everyone's on the same page. Um, you got a really tough opening game against England, but, you know, obviously Quinn's goal gives you guys a 1-1 draw and uh, really gives you the, the path into into winning the group, which you guys did. But um, I I don't want to take too much of your time. So let's talk about the, the Algeria goal. Um, you know, the Algeria game, it's kind of the same scenario. You guys, you guys were on, were on the offense of the entire game, you know, chance after chance. And it felt like one of those moments where it just wasn't going to happen. You know, we got screwed with the, with Maurice as a, a, his goal in the second game, but um, you're, you know, Tim Howard distributes the ball. It's what four and four going forward. And I think you're kind of trailing the play at that point. What did, what did you see kind of happen in front of you? That, yeah, that goal was, um, so during that game, I think that we kind of had towards the end of the game, you kind of had that thought process where, you know, we managed to tie against England. We should have won against uh, Slovenia and got, you know, robbed out of a goal. And now we're about to tie our third game in a row and not lose any games and not qualify for the next round. So it was like inconceivable at that point. Um, and, and what happens is, uh, you know, for us tying or losing didn't matter. Right. So to some degree you start putting more players forward. And I think that's what happened on that play, because if you go back maybe five seconds before Tim Howard gets the ball, that was a really dangerous chance for Algeria. And I think we were just kind of like pushed forward. We don't have, you know, defensively, we're kind of defending with four, maybe five. 
And, uh, and we get lucky that Tim, you know, is in the right spot. He reads the play, he gets the ball. And of course he's looking to, re you know, distribute quickly. And so as soon as he, as soon as he throws it to Landon, you could tell there's something there. I mean, you could, if you're a fan in the stadium, if you're watching the game on TV, um, the announcers, uh, you could tell something could come of this and it's probably got to be now or, or it's going to be never. Right. So, um, you know, you see Landon, Josie, uh, Edson, and Clint uh, all kind of running. It's almost like four horsemen, you know, going up the field. And Algeria's defense is backing up. And it's kind of man-on-man -man at that point where it's, I mean, not man-on-man, -man, but like four-on-four -four kind of thing. I'm kind of trying – you can't see me in the picture, but I'm trying to catch up to a speedy Landon kind of throw towards the middle of the field. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of – behind you know I'm not really in the play but I have a perfect picture as to what is happening in front of me and so you know Landon drives and he drives enough where he kind of has to commit a guy a little bit before he plays it to Josie Josie peels off well and makes like a little run where he kind of stays on side as soon and Clint is following it a little bit ahead and as soon as Josie gets the ball and Clint sees it this is the thing that you know Clint does so well because he's so hungry to score goals he sprints in front of the defender. And once he gets just a nose out in front of the defender, then the goalie's got to make a miraculous play. And once, you know, obviously the goalie does make a great play, but the fact that Clint is there allows Landon to pick up the pieces and behind, because if Clint doesn't make that run, there's no one to cross the ball to. And so, um, you know, you see it all happening. And I think I might've been one, me and probably Landon were probably two of the only people in the world that were rooting for the U S to win that didn't freak out when Clint didn't score because we saw that the ball's popping up right to land and, and the goalie's on the ground. So you're like, this is even better than, than what you could have hoped for. You know, Landon's about to score as long as he doesn't shank the ball on a, in a wide open net. And so, um, you know, it, you can almost see Landon, of course, because he's faster than me, but behind him, I, I almost sprint before he even kicks it in the goal because I'm already ready to go celebrate with him. And so, um, you know, unbelievable moment in, in U.S. soccer history uh, and something that, it's, again, it's hard to describe. It was, it was um, so much uh, – it was like building up to so much disappointment had it ended up in a draw. And then you get that, you know, euphoric moment of, man, we're, we're about to win the group. Like, we're, we're through in the World Cup. Like, it's a last second. How, how can you even, you know – be part of something like, like this, you know, let, be part of the world cup and let alone a, a moment like this to kind of, you know, take first place in the group and qualify to the next round. Yeah. Yeah. Go I got a, a question on that too. If I can hop in, I think in, in those moments for us as fans or guys that are, that are really diehards um, that moment and like the confederations cup, you kind of see, uh, you know, your, your aunts and your uncles and your grandparents, people that won't normally watch the game are suddenly commenting on it and they know players right. that you would think they never know they're paying attention do you feel that as a player in those moments do you feel like that kind of expansion while you're while you're just doing media or while you're in the locker room yeah I mean the, I remember after that game we all went back Bob uh surprised us with all our family we had been in basically isolation right concentration only the team in in our hotel and he he invited all the families, like every, everybody that had family there came to the hotel and we had like this big celebration for whatever, a couple hours, um, you know, dinner and being able to hang out with our family and celebrating the fact that we had gone through. And I remember once we, and I was dying, like I was, I was enjoying that, but I was dying to get back into the room with Johnny. Johnny Bornstein was my roommate to just go over like what the hell was going on on the internet, you know, with, with, and then we saw that video of, that had already been compiled like video clips of bars all over the country. And we're watching this like five minute video of all these uh, reactions to the goal. And we're like, this, is this really happening, dude? It's, it feels like a movie. It's not like real life. And so, um, yeah, it's, it was incredibly emotional and like awesome to just see, you know, the expanse of, of what was taking place. Um, yeah. I didn't have Twitter back then, but I remember my Facebook was blowing up. So uh, <laughs> What a, what a cool thing to remind um, fans that like those, those experiences in the bar and like what the reactions are fans still matter to like players like you. Uh, is, that was the one of the big moments for our chapter bar in Lincoln, Nebraska is like one of those, one of the main videos is on uh, was one of the reactions at our bar with someone holding up this like 
a chair. Uh, I'm and, wondering, I'm wondering if, this, so there's one clip and I think it's the first clip because yeah, it's the hard. longest clip. Was that yeah. the one in Nebraska? <laughs> yeah. yeah so <laughs> there's one guy that I love because he sees it before anybody else. Yep. So that, that was like me, that was like me and Landon. Like we knew what was happening before it happened. And like, why is it someone that was, <laughs> is it one of you guys? <laughs> No, no. no uh, he, <laughs> but that guy happens to be deaf, and so the the there was one TV that was like non HD, but it had the subtitles. So he saw it like three seconds before the rest of the world saw it because they weren't really? timed up the same. So uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it was incredible. Just, so like, yeah. Yeah, that I, I like, I really could see myself as that guy because when I'm <laughs> watching games, I feel like I see things before other people see it as well, and so. Um, you know, that guy knew it was coming. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously fantastic moment for, for you guys um, and AO as well, because that was kind of one of the first moments that, like with those videos that kind of got our name around. But, you know, obviously we had been around. But um, obviously that was a, one of those peak moments in U.S. soccer history that kind of has put us on this, this uh, climb to, to being where we are today. But, um, I'm going to kind of fast forward a little bit and uh, you leave Aarhus, 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 in, two, Aarhus Aarhus. in 2011, uh, come back to MLS. Tell me quickly, you know, why did you decide to come back and, and, and why the revs? Um, well, I didn't choose the revs. Uh, I, I chose to come back to MLS. Like the, the it, unfortunate the way that like MLS, you know, decides who gets players coming back from overseas but I went through the allocation process. Um, the first reason why I came back to MLS, um, my contract was running out in Aarhus, uh, and there was the massive dip in, uh, in, in salaries in, in Europe and probably all over the world because it was two years, what, after, or two or three years after 2008 and the, you know, financial collapse. So in terms of money, Denmark had gone down, you know, considerably. Um, and, and I, you know, wanted to eventually come back to MLS. And I thought, you know, I was getting, I was getting good salary to come back. And so financially it made sense. So I decided, all right, I'm, I'm going to do it. And on top of that, Chivas USA had the first allocation, um, uh, whatever it's called, first allocation position. And, uh, and, and I'm from California. So I thought if I end up there, that's a pretty good spot. And so I had heard from my agent, Chivas USA was either going to take me or trade me to Houston, which was the team that seemed like they had the most interest. And I thought, okay, Houston, you know, I can do that. They're, they're a good team. Um, you know, I, I've lived in Houston before, but, um, you know, I, for me, it would be about, you know, where I live and where I'm going to start a family or, you know, I want to go to a good team. And so Chivas took, I, there was like a deadline for, for me to, for them to make a decision. And it went like five hours past the deadline. It was crazy. Like typical, you know, MLS rules that <laughs> kind of are made as we go. And so, you know, they eventually passed. They decided, you know, my contract would have been too big. It would have, you know, hurt them financially. And so they passed instead of trading me. And then I went to Philly and Philly passed with Peter um, Novak. And then it went to New England and I knew Houston was four. So I knew I was either going to go to New England or Houston at this point and New England took me. And so um, the only thing I really knew about New England then was that they were on turf. So that was the only thing that really bothered me. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, New England was, you know, tough in terms of the results. We didn't get results there and it, it was disappointing um, the time there. And sp specifically my second year, the team was a little bit better, but I played worse. My first year I played better, but the team was not very good. And, you know, we started to improve the second year, but I didn't play very well. And um, then it was kind of like a mutual thing where New England, you know, didn't want to keep me at the number that I was at. And I really didn't want to stay there either. I wanted to go on a, to a better team. And it worked out perfectly because Peter knew me from the twenties. He brought me into Kansas city and you know, that that's probably where I played my best soccer in my career. Yeah. So, so about the time, I guess, rewinding a little bit about the time that you go to, to new England, uh, you're in Klinsman gets named as a national team coach. And um, you know, you're, you, you just said you had a couple of bad years in new England, but then you come to, to sporting and you have what I would, I would assume are your five best club years and you instantly become a, a legend at our club. Um, I speak for a couple of us on this podcast, but um, we're all it. SKC fans here. Yeah, we are. It. Um, it's easy to love SKC, man. It is. So 
for the Wizards. Guess, whatever. <laughs> my question would be, you know, you're playing well from, you know, when you come to 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 KC, you're still not getting a look from from Jurgen. Is was that the time that you kind of knew that it wasn't going to happen for you under under Jurgen, or or was it was there a specific moment? Um. Yeah, I mean, specifically in 2015 when I was playing my best soccer in my career um, and I was still not getting called up, I, I pretty much knew that I wasn't going to get called into the national team with Jurgen as a coach. So he had called me in three times during January uh, camps. Um, in 2012, he called me in. I, In my opinion, I was one of the best players at that camp and I played, I started against Venezuela uh, as a supporting striker, which really isn't my position. I played not that well, played, had a couple of good passes, but didn't play very well. Didn't play at all in the second game. We had a second game, I think, against Panama. And then I never got called in again until 2013 January camp, where I had an, a decent January camp. Wasn't one of the best players, but decent January camp. Never got called up again. And then he called me in after 2013 when we won MLS Cup. In 2014, I had a bad January camp in Brazil. And after that, I legitimately never got called in again. And so, um, yeah, it was just January camps for me personally are the hardest ones to, to, to play well in because I, my biggest weakness is my fitness. And so, you know, after off season, I, I can do as much as I can, but I'm never going to be game fit. And so coming into January camps, um, you know, I just wasn't going to be at my best. Uh, having said that, I think that I should have been able to get an opportunity by proving that I was playing well at my club, uh, especially in 2015, 2016, but it just never happened. And I think after 2015 and I never got an opportunity, I, you know, I realized, okay, it's not going to happen. And it's almost, you know, mentally better to decide, you know, that, that this is probably done than they keep expecting or hoping for a call when it's probably never going to come. Well, I think you said in an interview at one point that you had essentially closed a book on your national team career at that point. But 2017, Klinsman gets fired after some bad qualifying games and Bruce gets called in. Um, when that happened, were you thinking that maybe there's another chance for you? Yeah, definitely. So Bruce, I remember the first things that he said was that they needed more creativity in the middle. And so I thought, you know, the three guys that I thought of instantly about creativity in terms of American players was me, Sasha, and Lee. Those are the three guys that I – you know, could say are true number 10s or close enough, I guess, and that can provide creativity. Yeah, you can say, you know, like a Darlington Nagby, but he's a little bit of a different position than we are. He's more of like an eight. Anyway, so I thought, you know, we have a chance. And he called me and Sasha up to January camp. And, uh, you know, it, it almost seemed like it was me and Sasha battling for one spot on the team and potentially the other one maybe as a backup. And so, you know, as friends, we, yeah, we're going to compete, but we were – really excited about that opportunity because neither of us had really gotten too many opportunities with Jurgen, although Sash had started getting some opportunities towards the end of uh, Jurgen's tenure there. So, um, you know, it was exciting that January camp. Uh, again, I don't think I played that well during that January camp, although I, during the games I played okay, but during the practices, not that well. Uh, I had, you know, a pretty good assist uh, against um, Jamaica, I think, in Chattanooga. Jordan Morris, right? Jordan Morris, um, and, and felt like, oh, maybe, you know, that'll give me an opportunity. But again, after that camp, I didn't get called in. You know, we, they, they, uh, they played, I think the very first game was Honduras and San Jose. Me or neither me nor Sasha got called in. I think me, I don't think me or Sasha got called in all the way up until I got called in the, uh, the last camp. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, why, uh, maybe I just, I, maybe I think I'm better than I actually am. And, and so it didn't work out, but I, I thought, you know, me and Sasha could have helped in some, in some way, or even, you know, Lee, a guy with a little bit more creativity that gives, you know, something a little bit different, even if it's not from the start, maybe coming off the bench. Um, but it didn't happen. And, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, it, it was unfortunate what, what happened. I, it sucked, you know, obviously me being there, even if I hadn't gotten in that game, I was, I was, you know, dreading the fact that, you know, if we lose that game and a couple other results go bad, that we don't make the world cup, which almost seems, it literally seems impossible when it, you're, you're the USA and you're playing in, in a CONCACAF region that really doesn't have many teams better than you. And so, 
um, yeah, it was extremely disappointing. Um, but you know, hopefully we can use it for some, for something better, uh, here in the future. But I guess if there has to have been some, some part of you that felt a little bit like, I don't know if vindication is the right word, but you know, we're up against the ropes and we have to score a goal and you're the guy that we put in, you know, and when my opinion, not enough time left in the game to actually make a difference, but um, there had to have been some, some personal sense of vindication for you to get put into that game. And, and you, you damn near scored the equalizer too. Yeah. So I, I didn't feel any vindication in that sense, but what I did think of was I really hope I come in here and it, I mean, if we, if we tie the game, great, but if I can tie this game, then I will have a nice, post-conference saying something about you know another coach that was part of the <laughs> national team before but um yeah that chance uh it actually didn't hit my head it had hit bobby wood's head but had his head not been there i am very 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 close to certain that i would have scored that goal so i yeah, man that 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 always plays in my mind i mean i it was crazy because i mean how many goals have i scored with my head very few and so when Christian got that ball and started driving towards the end line, I kind of stayed in the box. I was in the back post. I start moving towards the front post for God knows what reason. I have no idea. And the ball just seems like it's going right to my head, you know? And since the ball's coming from that side, the goalie was actually moving from his front post to his far post as the ball's moving. And I'm thinking I'm going to, I'm coming from the back post to the near. So I'm thinking I'm just going to smash it right down into the near post and he's running in the opposite direction. Like this is going to be a goal. And somehow I didn't even see Bobby, but Bobby backs up and kind of like flicks the ball. And I hit heads with him actually. And um, yeah, the goalie makes a pretty good save, but I could have sworn I was going to score that goal. And I feel like I almost already saw it before it happened that, you know, what, what, what the future held, but um, yeah, it wasn't to be, it was, it was extremely disappointing from, you know, a personal perspective, but obviously the team perspective was, was, was far worse. And so, um, disappointing to have that be the last, you know, game that you play with the national team. Yeah. That sucks. You hitting heads with Bobby Wood is like a description of just, just all the unluckiness that, <laughs> that happened. I know. Yeah. That sucks. Oh. So back, you know, after the, and I'm curious as a fan, what, what, you know, nobody from my perspective and people that I talked to, no one really saw what happened in 2018 with you and, and sporting happening was there something that was there a moment that you thought that that Peter was gonna gonna trade you or is that was that a personal decision or was it uh, so I I had never talked to Peter about getting traded so I didn't know you know for certain but I've been with Peter for five years so I can kind of read him sometimes and we had we had uh, lost in the first game of the playoffs for four years straight. And leading up to that last game where we played against Houston, we had played poorly up until that game. And I hadn't started a few games. And so we lost that game against Houston um, in overtime. And we were out of the playoffs. And I thought in my head, first of all, there's two expansion teams coming in. Um, wait, was there two or one? Did another team come with it? No, it was just LA. Just LA. So just one. So LAFC was coming in. And I thought – you know, there's, there's a chance that he tries to trade me, you know, um, I was what 33 at the, or turning 33 at the time. And, you know, I just, I, I sensed that there was a chance that he would trade me. Um, but this was, was in what October, November, like end of, I think we played that game, maybe Halloween. So anyways, um, a month or two go by, you know, the expansion draft is done. Nothing's happened. So I'm thinking, I'm starting to think, okay, well, I guess I'm not getting traded. I have one more year in my contract. Uh, let's go back to Kansas City and figure, and you know, let's let's play. And on January fourth, third or fourth, I believe, he calls me and he and I see it. And I'm actually, <laughs> I, I I got into bridge by the way, playing bridge with my dad. So I was playing a bridge tournament at the time. So I couldn't answer the phone, but I, I thought it was really weird. I was like, Peter's calling me. This is either something like that has that means nothing or he trade traded me like something big right and so I call him back like five minutes later and I'm like what's up and he tells me I got traded and so um right about the time when I thought okay I'm not going to get traded is when I did get traded crazy was well, it because I, you're playing bridge is that you got yeah, traded? May, maybe he thought I was getting too old and then that confirmed it <laughs> didn't Peter Novak tell you you played too much poker 
Yeah, that was, uh, that was one of the reasons I think I got cut from the qualifying camp for the U23s where we, uh, we would play poker with all the guys, or not all the guys, maybe like six, six or eight guys in a, in a room. I think he and Sasha were roommates, so we would have the poker room in our game, in our, in our room. And, uh, yeah, he, he cut me and he said, yeah, you, you were playing too much poker and that's like not what we want and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, I don't understand it, but okay. <laughs> That's great. So you go to LAFC and I think you, from my perspective, have a good season. Um, get traded to Colorado for what? Well, no, three? I didn't get traded. That was oh. the end of my contract. Okay. Contract's up. You go to Colorado for a year and then, uh, and then you eventually treat, you know, sporting's having a bad year. So Peter gets you back here. Um, I guess what was the feeling in going into your, into this last season? Um, and did you think it, it might be your last? Um, so pl- I had a good season at LAFC. I think the, the team had a better season than at least I would have anticipated from an expansion team. Um, and then I wanted to stay there. You know, I wanted to stay in LAFC. I'm from California. I, you know, wanted to probably finish my career there at that point. Uh, I didn't think it was viable to come and finish at Kansas City at that point. You know, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to end up coming back here. And so I thought, you know, I, I had five good years at Kansas City. Now let me play, you know, maybe two years, three years total in LAFC, and that'll be the end of the career. Um, and it was, I mean, bottom line, it ended up being a financial thing where um, I, I was willing to take a pay cut to stay at LAFC, but not the pay cut that they wanted to, to, to get me on. Um, I feel like we were really close in terms of, you know, what numbers were there. And then I'd say that add it, add that in with, you know, MLS has to approve every single deal. And so it like slows everything down. It just ended up dragging out, dragging out. And then Colorado came out of nowhere and offered me a, a better deal. And back to LAC, and I'm like, look, can you guys finish this up? I'll take, I'll take the deal. If you guys get these numbers to where, you know, I, I said I wanted to get them. And, and basically, you know, uh, with, I can't even say it was one person's fault, but like the, the fact that it's me, LAFC and MLS all kind of groveling over, you know, how this deal is going to get taken place. I just decided, okay, this is too much. Let me, let me go with Colorado and, and sign that deal. And so went to Colorado, definitely didn't expect the, the season to start out the way it did. I thought they had made some pretty good moves in terms of, you know, acquiring players, Diego, Kai, they had gotten Kellen Costa the year before. Um, Keegan um, so they they had improved their team and I thought you know I think I think this team can improve and so we went there and you know offensively the team was all right but we were leaking goals all over the place and at, at one point and once Anthony left Connor Casey took the the team I didn't start the first game that Connor was there and I was like look I'm not gonna I've only got maybe a year maybe you know a year and a half left uh, I want to I want to play and and I, and I want to play for a team that's competitive trying to win championships. And, uh, you know, this doesn't look like it, like, you know, what I want for the last year, especially not if I'm not playing, you know? And so it, it kind of came to be pretty quickly that sporting had an interest because of the injuries. And that made sense for me. And uh, the rest, uh, the rest will be good for all Colorado fans. Like they can say that they surpassed Kansas city after I said those quotes. So um, <laughs> they, they, they got the better of my quotes in that sense. But yeah, it was as, as difficult as it was the season last year in terms of, you know, having difficulty in Colorado and then having difficulty here in Kansas city, getting results. Um, you know, it's still, I think, a, a happy ending in terms of finishing with Kansas city as, as, as my team before I retire. Yeah. So I, I'm curious, when is the testimonial happening so we can start to train a little bit? <laughs> I haven't even thought about that yet. Do I even well, get a testimonial? We'll, we'll throw you one. It might just be <laughs> us and a six pack of beer, but we'll throw you one. Um, Sounds so I'm good. Curious, now, you know, with, with the podcast, you guys got that going on. It seems like it's been on the up and up. You're getting a lot more traction um, with that. And you've talked about, or you've hinted towards this. Are you working on your coaching license? Yeah, that's that's another unfortunate turn of events because of this um, COVID-19. So I was doing the B license and let me tell you, if anybody's been part of this, it's a lot of work. And um, you are there for 45 hours for three separate weeks. And I had done the first week and there's assignments and a lot of work being done there at home. 
and um, they had to cancel the course. So you get, you're not, we're not going to get the credit for all the work that, you know, we had done already. Um, there's a, we can get a little bit of credit from some of the assignments, but the majority of the stuff that we did, we have to redo. And so, yeah, I will eventually get back to, you know, finish doing my B license and I'd like to get the A license as well. Um, I'm not sure what the future holds in terms of, uh, you know, what I'm going to do, whether it's, you know, coaching is definitely an interest. Uh, being a GM in the league is an interest. Uh, media is an interest. And so I'll kind of keep all those avenues open and see what opportunities arise. Okay. So I guess for, from a fan perspective to our members, where would you say that, that American soccer is right now, both on the men and the women's side, you guys talk, you know, you've, made it clear you're a women's national team fan, you know, last year with the World Cup. Where do you think we are with them? And then where do you think we are with the national team for the men's side going into qualifying? Well, the women's team is at, you know, close to its peak, I'd say. I mean, they're, they're the best team in the world. You know, they've got the best players in the world. They've got the best personalities as well. And so um, they're, they're, they're probably more famous than, than the, the men's team as well. You know, I mean, like – you can't find a, a – I don't think Pulisic is more famous than Megan Rapinoe right now. You know, you, you could probably go up to people that don't know anything about soccer. They know who Megan Rapinoe is. And so, um, you know, the, the women's game is at its peak. Um, and the men's game is, you know, in a, in a lull right now, unfortunately, where, um, you know, we, we hit our rock bottom with not qualifying for the World Cup. And then since we kind of haven't been able to really get going anywhere, um, there, you know, the the whole quarantine thing as well has slowed things down. Um, there just hasn't been that many games with, uh, with all the players involved. You know, I think there's, there's been injuries. There's been, there, we're lacking a little bit of like that veteran leadership. And so a lot of the young guys have to become veterans quickly. You know, Christian Pulisic was the, the captain. Then Weston McKinney was the captain. These guys are young, man. And I think it's hard. I think it's, it's hard enough to be put into a position where, you have to be one of the top players in, 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 in on the team right from the start. And now you got to lead other guys that are your age as well. And so it's, it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be a slow process. Um, but I think if it's done properly, it'll, it'll benefit us in the long run because you'll have a lot of those guys hopefully be part of the team for a long time. Good stuff. That's all the questions I had. Cody, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, it kind of ties into what you're saying a little bit, but I was thinking eight, you kind of come from a, a unique perspective that not many people have having played both for, for Peter Vermes and Bob Bradley, both under club and country in some capacity. So I know everybody knows about, about Peter's approach, uh, whether it be the press or how he, how he looks at fitness and, and those sort of things and how he kind of builds for the future. For that reason, a lot of people wanted him as uh, the national team manager. And I think for that reason, some people didn't want him because they didn't think maybe he'd get enough time to build the stuff that he can build. I guess having played under him and Bob and seeing how you have to adjust uh, to being with club or with country, how do you think uh, Peter would do in that role? Or do you think he's better staying off? At I think he would do well. I think he'd do well. And the biggest reason why I think he'd do well is because he doesn't take shit from anybody. And so, <laughs> and that's Bob too. I mean, Bob's a, a straightforward guy. And I think that was one of his biggest qualities. Like, yeah, you have guys like Landon that you have to, to some extent, appease because he's one of the best players on the team. Or Clint, that sometimes is difficult to deal with as well because he's got, you know, he, he thinks everybody's, you know, he has a chip on his shoulder with everybody. And so, um, you know, there's guys like that that you have to deal with on the national team. And I think that Peter, he doesn't care who you are. You know, he doesn't care if you're the best team, best player, the worst player. If you don't do what he's asking you to do, he's going to, he's not going to play. He's going to get rid of you. And so, yeah, maybe there'd be a couple of, you know, rough spots there, but I think Peter would eventually get the best out of the team and get people to want to play for the jersey, for the country, for, you know, the coach, the players, players that had come before and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's one thing that, um, you know, needs to improve. You know, guys want to – guys got to have to want to come into camp, got to want to want to play for the team – um, and, and I know there's a lot of guys that do, but I don't think it's everybody right now. And I think that's kind of, um, been a problem, honestly, ever since Jurgen kind of took over, I think some of that stuff kind of, uh, dissipated a little bit. 
Chris and I were talking before the podcast about uh, Maurice Adu being a guest on your show and t- telling a pretty uh, funny story about Clint uh, in a cell phone, I think. Was that right? <laughs> right. Cause, would that fly under, under Peter or would that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that – dude, Clint – I mean, Clint is, is always going to – it doesn't matter. Like, the thing with Clint is you, you could have, you know, the toughest guy on this side. He's still going to, you know – stare him down and so maybe that would still happen but um you know with uh I think Peter would Peter wouldn't kind of um I don't think he'd let something like that get to that point um but that was I mean that was more of a funny story where I think Peter Novak didn't realize what was coming you know he thought he was going to you know play with Clint whereas Clint was like not in a playing mood at that time (laughs) he I think his wife was pregnant so he was waiting for a phone call so yeah, you don't want to mess with Clint when he's angry. He's uh, he's brutally honest, and he won't let you get away with it. If you guys haven't heard it, listen to uh, Benny's podcast with Marisa Du. He he tells some pretty epic stories. But um, so Benny, on behalf of American Outlaws, I just want to say thank you for coming on this podcast. It means a lot to us and our members. Um, we we obviously wish you the best in retirement and. Uh, we look forward to more BSI the podcast, and uh, hopefully someday we're we're uh, we get the call up for the uh, testimonial. So, yeah, I appreciate appreciate it, Chris, uh, and we appreciate you guys as well. Obviously, with the national team, um, you know, you guys you guys are always there and and cheering us on. So that's always been fantastic for us. Like I said, my biggest memory was during that uh, Gold Cup game where you know there there was no Mexican fans left left. And we were all just, you know, rooting and cheering and running around the stadium and holding the, the, the uh, cup up in the air for you guys. And so that's always special. Awesome stuff. Well, thanks again, man. And uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy your time at home while you can. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you soon. Yeah. Thanks. You guys too.